Once you get past the basic mechanics of how to spin yarn, then you're going to want to start to explore different techniques and fibres so you can actually make the yarn that you want to use. One of the ways of doing this is sampling. So in part one of this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview and process for sampling a fiber that maybe you've not spun before or haven't spun in a long time. In part two of this video, I will be sharing some updates on some of the projects that I've shown you over the last few weeks. And I'm also gonna be giving you the results of the little viewer survey that I did at the end of December and just sort of where I think I'm going to take the channel forward, different projects that I want to share with you. I also have a bit of a decision to make, so I'm just going to kind of put the question out there into the universe and maybe you can help me with the decision making process and just leave a comment below. So without further ado, if you're new to this channel, my name's Becca and I'm a hand spinner, knitter and newbie weaver and you're very welcome to my home in West Wales. If you're an old friend, welcome back. So you've probably heard of the term test spinning and sampling, but what do we actually mean by that in the hand spinning world? I mean, it really is self-explanatory. You are experimenting with different styles of spinning and actually keeping records of what you're doing. Okay, so hands up. Do as I say, not as I do. I am terrible at taking notes and keeping records. One of the advantages of actually videoing YouTube videos is I'm now able to look back at the footage to see what I did because I am terrible at actually, you know, writing down as I'm doing it, how I'm spinning things. So while I would definitely say a notebook is a good way, if you're not great at taking notes like me, then actually maybe just take some photographs or take a little bit of video. And that can be another way of keeping a record to what you're actually doing. And one of the main reasons we probably want to do this is if we have got a specific project in mind, so we're doing some very intentional spinning, so we want to have repeatable results. So if you're a production spinner, then most definitely you're going to want to have repeatable results. If you're doing a big project like, say, a jumper or a blanket, then you definitely want to be able to get a consistent look and feel to your yarns so when you're actually knitting out the project it kind of works because um, it's quite easy to get lots of different variations in your yarn when you're doing a really big spin. One of the ways to alleviate that is to actually have records and to kind of look at what you're doing. So in this video we're just going to do the sort of the start of the process so we're going to look at what method we're going to use to spin and also we're going to have a look at the amount of twist we're putting in and then finishing two different samples. So we're gonna have a sample that's unfinished, so I haven't wet finished it, and a sample that has been wet finished, so we can actually assess the wraps per inch so that we get a good idea as to how the yarn is going to behave when we've actually done the whole process. So we're only spinning up little bits. These are kind of little mini skeins and they are probably about 25 grams, which is, uh, what's 25 grams in old money? It's slightly less than an ounce. So um, I take way out 25 grams, split it in half, and then I've got my two plies. So today I'm working with a fibre that I've not spun before, but I am quite excited about spinning it. It is from a Welsh mule sheep. And if you are unfamiliar with that term, a mule, and you get English mules, Scottish mules, and Welsh mules, um, I'm afraid I don't know if it's a term that's used in other parts of the world. If you know, drop a comment below. As always, I'm always delighted to learn new spinning terms. So let me know if there is a, an equivalent in your area of the world. And a mule is a cross between a local mountain sheep, in this case a Welsh mountain sheep, and a blue place Leicester. The idea is that you improve the quality of the fleece for spinning and kind of using in general of the local Welsh mountain sheep 
Welsh mountain sheep, particularly if they're actually living up on the mountains and they're not in a sort of more domestic setting, say a small holder, sorry, small holder, again, if you're in the States, small holder, read um, Homesteader. So if you are in a, a situation where you're a small fibre producer, you probably are not having your sheep sort of up living on the mountains full time. So they have a, a very different fleece to a Welsh mountain sheep that is living out all the time, just sort of living on heather and gorse and a little bit of grass. They don't have the same quality of fleece as say somebody who is keeping a Welsh mountain sheep kind of with access to a barn or maybe on a more lowland setting. Welsh mountain sheep can be a bit hairy. They are full of kemp quite often and maybe not the most luxurious of fibres. They certainly have their place and I have a rug that I made that is um, woven with Welsh mountain sheep. In fact, I'm gonna stop the video here and go and get it and show you. Okay, so said hearth rug, well used. And this is woven by me, spun and woven by me on a small rigid heddle loom. I know that's not normally what you would weave a rug on, but it, it sort of works. I mean, it's a little bit soft, but you know, it's fine, it works for me. But I have to tell you that this is quite hairy. Um, again, whether you can actually see how hairy it is, I don't know. But when I was spinning this, I, there were bits of Kemp all over the place. And I was thinking, yeah, this I'm not going to be wearing as a jumper. But as a carpet or a rug, fantastic. Super hard wearing. This has been in and out of the washing machine and has little bits of, you know, sort of wood, um, like embers have fallen on here. And the carpet hasn't melted underneath because you've got the rug on, which is exactly what a rug like this is for. So just sort of in front of the fire and the properties of the Welsh mountain sheep fleece. Put my teeth back in, did I say that right? Yes, Welsh mountain sheep fleece is that it's extremely hard wearing and so ideal for this type of project. But if you actually want to use it for say a jumper or a hat or something, then maybe not ideal. So crossing with the blue faced Leicester, you get a much more luxurious fibre and therefore a much more luxurious yarn. My fibre comes from a Cambrian wool company and they have a shop in Cardigan, which for me is sort of 20 miles up the road. They also do uh, an online service and it's a community-based company so that local farmers in the Cambrian mountains, which is sort of mid Wales basically, and they uh, actually are part of this community cooperative project so that they get a good amount of money for the fleeces that they're producing. So we've got friends that run a thousand ewes across the Welsh mountains and they do not get any money for the fleeces. They obviously still have to shear their sheep and there is a huge cost involved in that, in manpower and transport and actually transporting the fleece to the centre where all the wool goes, which is um, part of the British Wool Marketing Board. But they don't get their money back on that because actually the fleece is only good enough for sort of insulation and carpets because they, you know, the sheep are running around on quite harsh Welsh mountains. but. By crossing with the Blue Face Leicester, the farmers that are a part of the Cambrian Wool Company actually get a bit more for their fleeces, so it starts becoming viable for them. Hill farmers really do struggle to make a living, but if you think about the beautiful Welsh countryside and those beautiful mountains, they look like that because of the Welsh mountain sheep. So as sort of people who enjoy the countryside and enjoy the environment that we have around here, really we need our farmers to be managing this environment. So really, we need to be able to make it worthwhile for them to carry on managing the environment the way they have been for hundreds of years. So by supporting this company, I really feel that I'm doing my little bit to help maintain a way of life that has, after all, been going on for hundreds of years. So I shall get off my soapbox and let's have a look at the fibre. 
it's always really exciting to get a parcel and especially exciting to get a parcel of fibre. Now this, as I said, came from a Cabrian wool company and I ordered a kilo because I'm really keen to use this for the basis of the spinning that I'm going to be doing over the next few months. So as I'm unpacking it, I'm just sort of doing a very quick visual assessment of the fibre, how it feels, how much bounce there is in it, and then just a quick staple length test. So pull out a length of fibre and I've got my little six inch ruler there and you can see that it's just over the six inches so that's quite a long fiber so that really is going to decide how i'm going to spin it in it a good way to start spinning a long fiber is to spin from the fold and i'm just pulling out a staple length and folding it over my finger and then you can either draft directly off your finger or as i am here just from the folded fibre and as I'm doing this I'm feeling there's quite a lot of grease on this fibre it's comb top so there would have been some grease added to it in the preparation but I also think there's quite a lot of lanolin left in it so I'm just testing I'm seeing how it spins so I'm going to try slightly different methods of spinning from the fold when it's folded over my finger and then I'm also going to fold it over my finger and then take it off my finger and just sort of spin it and draft it from in between my two fingers. All the time I'm assessing what the fibre is like. There are a few second cuts in this which you quite often get in a smaller production. So from the really, really big mills you tend not to get second cuts but a smaller production run like this it's not surprising that there are a few second cuts. Not enough to make me not want to spin the fibre, but you know, it just is something I need to consider. I'm just doing a playback test and you can see that it's far too much twist. So I'm actually turning up my tension so that the fibre is being drawn in more quickly and that will reduce the amount of twist that I have in my fibre. Now I'm not actually going to be using this yarn that I make for anything, I literally am just seeing how I'm going to get the best results. So I'm going to switch between different methods, I'm going to mess around with the tension, I'm just going to keep playing around until I've really found the method that's working best for the fibre. Because I'm spinning comb top, I really am best off going for a worsted or semi-worsted yarn which means that I'm either doing, as I said, spinning off the fold or this sort of short forward draw or a short backward draw. You're not going to get a woolen finish off this. And to be honest, because of that blue faced Leicester that is crossed with the Welsh mountain sheep in order to get this fleece, then there's quite a lot of luster and I want to maintain that luster. So really, a worsted yarn or a semi-worsted yarn is going to maintain more of that luster and that shine that you naturally get than a woolen preparation. So the more I'm spinning this, the more I'm getting feedback from the fibre and I'm working out how it wants to be spun and I'm getting into a rhythm and I sort of really switched to actually just my well my bog standard spin and that is a sort of short backward draw which I particularly like and it seems to work very well for this so I'm going to make this mini skein so I will obviously spin another ply and then ply the two yarns together and then I will actually spin up a, another sample skein with 
the method that I've sort of developed with this first mini skein. Using a yarn gauge is another really good practice when you're sampling and by seeing which slot that the yarn or the single fits best into you can then make an assessment of what your likely wraps per inch are going to be. I will go into this in more detail in another video. I'm making a standard two ply yarn and so I am plying my yarn anti-clockwise. So I span it clockwise and now I'm plying it anti-clockwise. So the lazy cape that I had that came with this wheel doesn't have a break. So I'm using my rear hand as a break to stop the yarn from sort of I want to say catapulting itself, but it really doesn't do that. But to try and stop it from sort of twisting back on itself before I'm actually putting it onto the bobbin. Now it works very well for me and I think you just get used to whatever equipment you've got. So onto the nitty noddy and the next stage is going to be wet finishing. So here we have the results of my spinning. And you can see this is the first skein that I made and I haven't wet finished this. And this is the second skein that has been wet finished. And you can see how much the wet finishing has really bounced up this wool. And it's just, oh, lovely and soft. Maybe a tad overspun, but hey, I can alter that the next time I spin it. And then this is the, in comparison, the mini skein that is going to go into my pot that I use for sort of scrap yarn so I shall use it for tying up skeins and sort of other things that you use scrap yarn for. So it's lovely and bouncy. I'm really pleased with the way it looks. There's you've got that little bit of luster and the sort of crimp has meant that it's bounced up really nicely. Not the most even of spins but as I said before, I'm not that bothered about consistency in my yarn, really. I like my hand spun to look like hand spun if I wanted to have yarn that looked like it came from a factory. I'd just buy it from a factory. So, you know, personal opinion. So there you go. So I can now do my wraps per inch. I could spin another test sample and maybe alter a few more things. And there you go. There it is. So I now need to take some records of this and I have been working on a different way of recording it because as I've said I'm really bad at actually making notes. So I've sort of started doing a little bit of almost junk journaling and I'll just give you a quick flick through of what I've done so far and see what you think. I'd love a bit of feedback on it. So I hope you found that useful. If there's anything you think I should have mentioned, then please pop it in the comments below because I really would like this channel and this space to be somewhere where us hand spinners can all learn from each other. I would also like to make a quick request is if you could like this video and consider subscribing to the channel, that would be really helpful because I'm having absolute blast making these videos, but it would be really great if I could get to that magical thousand subscribers and 400 no not 400 4000 watch hours because then i would have a little bit of income so i could then buy some more exciting fibers that i could demonstrate to you so without further ado i'm going to move on to part two so in my last video i showed this knit felt bag and i said it needed a lining so I have been into the fabric stash, which is sadly kind of as big as, sadly, no, it's not sadly. Okay, fabric stash, kind of as big as the fiber stash, but you know, we can't loss over that because we're not talking about stashes. Anyway, I have lots of remnants from a lady who makes 
wedding dresses, ball gowns and the like. And I collected together all these colours that I thought would really work and I'm actually going to give it a very luxurious satin or silk lining. Um, it's probably going to be this colour because I think this is the one that goes with the bag for best. So I've nearly finished that. On to the next one. So you may remember this hat from a few weeks ago and I was sort of halfway, well more than halfway through the knitting and then kind of Christmas happened and everything slowed down but I have now finished it apart from the bobble so I've got enough yarn left to make the bobble and I'm really pleased with the way it turned out and yeah it's good I've got a, another pattern from that book that I want to knit but I'll come on to that in a minute so there you go that's that project so in October I started knitting these socks and basically that was finished in about a week and then this has been sitting in my project bag not finished since middle of October but it's nearly there I've turned the heel it's nearly there so that's going to get finished fairly quickly and then I'm going to cast on another sock and that will be from the yarn that I demonstrated oh sort of gosh yes it will be back in October so I will link that below and you'll be able to get an idea of uh, the sort of the process I go through when I'm spinning my sock yarn Okay, so that is the project update. So at the end of December, I put up a little community post asking what sort of content you'd like to see. And I sort of had four questions, natural dyeing, fiber processing, um, spinning techniques and processing raw wool. I don't think it was in that order, but those are the questions. And the two that really kind of were the winners were the fiber processing and the spinning techniques. So I certainly do intend to include those in the videos. And that sort of brings me on to the next point. So I sort of have a bit of a decision to make because as I've said many times before, I started this channel on a whim. If I'm absolutely honest, I was procrastinating in my other business because I have a little online shop where I sell um, gosh what do I sell stickers and uh, wedding invitations and business cards it's basically it's graphic design and some of it is with vintage illustrations some of it is with the illustrations that I do and I've had it for about five years and it ticks away quite nicely but over the last few months the sales have really dipped and that could be because of the economic kind of way things are in the economics that doesn't even make sense you know the economy that's what I'm trying to say the economy it could be the economy it could also be the impact of AI and I mean I don't use AI to generate my illustrations maybe you know maybe that's it I'm not sure but the sales have dipped so I probably have to make a decision whether I'm going to put my time into that or whether I'm going to really refocus and put my time into this channel. I have to say I'm loving what I'm doing on this channel but I am always a little bit cautious of not turning a hobby you love into a job you hate. So as much as I'm sitting here going yay it's great I'm loving it there is that little nagging doubt at the back of my mind is if I go all in and refocus my website and start really kind of putting the content out there and really being active on social media, am I going to have turned this little kind of fun side project into a job and I'm not gonna to want to do it? So, I'm not sure and I've been wrestling with this for a few weeks really and I haven't actually come up with any answers so if you if you have any suggestions I'd love to hear them because I I'm flip-flopping about this I kind of I think when I go for a walk and obviously I walk the dog a couple of times a day 
and I had been very preoccupied with, okay, what do I do? It's actually the beginning of the year, so it's quite a good time to make some of these decisions and make some of these plans. And certainly I am planning content and I'm kind of, I really want to, you know, get some alpaca and do some demonstrations on alpaca. And I want to actually get some more projects kind of underway. I also want to really, really get my kind of my head around the, the weaving I've been attempting to do because it's really, I really want to do it, but I'm kind of getting stuck in various places, which is probably a subject for another video. So that long rambling kind of explanation is me basically saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I know, I'd really appreciate some feedback. I mean, you might think that these videos are just fine the way they are and uh, just keep doing what you're doing, Rebecca, and don't overanalyze it because, you know, that is one of the things that I do. So on that note, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you for watching. If you've got this far, I'd love to know who you are. So either say hi on Instagram and I'll leave the link below or drop a little comment below and um, I always respond to the comments. I don't always respond to them kind of that day because I do try and kind of do all my responding at once at one time. So I'm kind of in the zone of uh, thinking about hand spinning and things. So be patient with me if I haven't answered you within the kind of 10 minutes or an hour, but I will answer you. So until next time, happy spinning. <laughs>